Okay, so we're going to do hopefully a not too long lecture just on some concepts around um, SAM BAM files and some other kind of gotchas related to alignment files and formats. So this will be, yeah, SAM BAM and very briefly BED. So you guys have already started playing around with your SAM BAM files a little bit. Um, I think you've just created some BAM files. I'll say that this would be a good time to just step back and um, explain a little bit how they work. Um, so this was mentioned before, but SAM and BAM are basically the same thing. SAM is just the uncompressed version of the BAM file, or BAM is the compressed version of the SAM file. BAM files are usually indexed, um, so you really can't use a BAM file without it being indexed usually. Uh, and I think you guys have already created your indexes as well, right? Yeah. So um, what is in a SAM BAM file? Uh, I think Malachi might have already poked around in it a little bit, uh, but it's basically divided into two sections. So there's a header section, and then that's relatively speaking, a small part of the file. It has kind of like metadata about your alignments. And then there's the alignment section itself that has like row by row um, where each read is aligned or not aligned. So I'm just showing some examples, but we're gonna kind of dig in and um, decompose them. So the header section is used to describe the source of the data, the reference sequence. It can also have information about how the reads were actually aligned. Uh, and it's broken into these different sections using different headers, which each start with the at character. So for example, the at HD section is, has header lines. And this will tell you things like about the version of, or the format version of the BAM file itself. It might have things like the sort order of your alignments. So if you did position sorting or read name sorting, um, that would be indicated there. There's then sometimes a fairly big section of SQ lines uh, where, or the SQ section, which has the reference sequence dictionary. So this basically lists all of the reference sequences that your alignment was against. So for us, it would be like chromosome 22 and the ERCC spike ins is what we would expect to see there. Typically it would be like all the chromosomes or all the contigs in the assembly that you're aligning against. And then there's a read group section, which has read group information. Um, so this could be things like um, information about your samples, your libraries, um, your sequencing instruments, that sort of thing. And then there's a last section, the PG section or program section has information about the kind of bioinformatics aspects, like what kind of um, alignment software was used to produce the file. So this header section can be really important, especially for like after the fact forensics, like you're going back to a project that you did six months or two years ago, and you're trying to remember like, how did I even align this data? Which reference did I align it against? Which version of BWA MIM did I use? And it's even more important when you get data from someone else, right? And you're trying to like understand what did they do? Can I use this alignment? Um, data the way they gave it to me, or do I need to like maybe realign it because something about the way they did it is not compatible with like the downstream analysis goals that I have. So it can be really helpful to dig into the header of your BAM file. And you probably can't see it on the last one, but you can do this very simply with like a SAM tools view dash capital H and then give your BAM file name and it will basically print out that header to screen. Um, so this is actually maybe a little easier to see the zoom in view of that header section. Um, so you're seeing things like version number, you're seeing that it's coordinate sorted. Um, you're seeing like here that we had chromosome 22 as one of the sequences we were aligning against. There's some read group information. So this is telling us about like the platform. So it was on an Illumina of this particular flow cell with this particular library name and sample name, so that kind of metadata. And then here's these program lines where you can see that this particular alignment looks like was aligned with Top Hat, 
um, and mark duplicates was run. So that can also be kind of useful information, right? About how your alignment has been processed. And then here's an example of that alignment section. So each line is not fitting onto, or each record is not fitting onto just one line of the screen. So it's kind of like spilling across three lines. And we're gonna go through each of these sections one by one. It's not as scary as it looks. It's basically a, like a tab delimited file that's got, I don't know, 12 or 11 columns in it. And one of those columns is your sequence read, right? So you can see the sequence here. And then there's just a bunch of other information to help you understand how that read was aligned or not aligned. So what are the, the components of the alignment records in the BAM file? So this is right from the BAM spam specifications. Um, these are like, you know, just online. You can find it in Wikipedia probably. Um, you have basically 11 columns, as I said. Uh, you have your query template name. Um, so this is actually usually just your read name. So it'll be that same read name that was in your FASTQ file typically. Uh, there's a bitwise flag. We'll talk more about that. So the bitwise flag is a single number. So here it's 99. Um, and it's just a number that's used to encode a whole bunch of other information. And we'll walk through how that works. Then the next one is your uh, reference sequence name. So this is the thing your query is, your read is being aligned against. So typically like a chromosome or something like that. So here, this is telling me that this particular read here uh, was aligned against chromosome one. Uh, and the first base of that alignment was at position 11623. Uh, so this is the one base leftmost most position of the alignment. Then there's something called mapping quality. So this gives you a sense for the overall read. What's the um, kind of uniqueness of the mapping of that read to the um, genome or whatever your reference is that you're aligning against. So we talked a little bit the other yesterday about multi-mapping, right? So if your read like maps many different places ambiguously in the genome, it would have a very poor or low mapping quality score. Most of the time your reads hopefully are long reads and they're mapping to unique parts of the genome, they would have good mapping quality scores. Like something like, I don't know, what's a good mapping quality score? 60? Three is low. Yeah. Three is bad, yeah. Then there's a cigar string. So we'll talk also in more detail about this. It basically gives a very compact way of describing the alignment. Uh, and then you have information about the mate pair. So if this is paired end sequencing, it's gonna tell you where the reads pair is aligned to. In this case, the equals is telling me that it's also on chromosome one and then at this position. So if you look at the two positions, you can kind of see like this seems sensible for a read pair right They're They're both aligned to chromosome one and they're like, I don't know, a few hundred base pairs apart. Uh, you get a template length estimate that's basically determined by the kind of the distance between the reads, your actual sequence, and then the quality string. And we talked about this when we talked about FASTQ files. So these letters down below are just kind of encoded uh, and there's like a lookup table that tells you which FRED quality score each of those correspond to. Any questions about the alignment section of a band file or anything else? Yeah. When would you use the quality score if it's for every single base? Like how would you possibly? The mapping quality like score or the individual base score? Quality base scores? Yeah. Oh, this part down here? Um, you would rarely, if ever, like personally, like in think about individual base scores of individual bases for the reads, but they're being used in various downstream analysis steps. Like, for example, imagine like variant calling software that's like trying to find a SNV or SNP. It's like looking at a pile of reads at a certain position and it's thinking like, okay, we have some, most of the reads here say A, but some of the reads say T. Am I convinced that that 
A to T variant is a real variant or that that T could just be like a random sequencing error. One of the key pieces of information would consider would be like the qual the base quality of the reads that say T at that position. So like a common thing would be that like maybe there's some sequencing errors that you know introduce a T, but they're actually like low FRED score. So the algorithm would like use that in its logic or heuristics or statistics to determine whether that's like a real variant or not. And there's there's probably lots of other applications. Um, we talked about like uh, trimming, how it would potentially throw away reads if there's too many bases that are too poor quality. So it's looking at this exact information. It's looking at that string of random letters and symbols and going to that lookup table and doing the math basically. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, I said we would dig into a couple of these fields a little bit more. So the one of them is this so-called flag and one of them is the cigar string. So let's talk about the flags first. So remember this literally just is a number, like it looks like 99 or 163. So what that one number is doing is giving you a whole bunch of information about the alignment in a very space efficient way. Um, and when I say space efficient, I'm mostly talking about like file size. So instead of having 12 more columns in the BAM file alignment records that have things like, is this alignment considered a duplicate or not? Or is its uh, mate pair aligned or not? Like all of these different attributes here, it's boiled that down to a single number. And the way it does that is by creating um, basically a binary string of length 12, where each of the values of this string can either be zero or one. And zero or one basically means yes or no for each of these kind of questions. Like, am I mapped or not, zero or one? Am I a duplicate or not, zero or one? So you can express the status of all of those 12 properties using this binary code of zeros and ones, right? So it's like any possible combination. It could be all zeros, it could be all ones or anything in between. If you figure out how many possible combinations there are, it turns out it's two to the 12, which is 4,096 combinations. So you can use the numbers from zero to 495 to represent the four, 4,095, sorry, the 4,096 possible states of this 12 digit binary. And that allows you to like encode all of this information in that one number. Does that make sense? So now you have this number that basically tells you the status of all of these things in a very efficient way. And you can use that with tools like Picard to apply like filters. So you could say like, give me all the reads that are duplicates. Like I wanna look at those for some reason. And so you can give the number that's like, I don't care about anything except yet that it's yes for duplicates. You can figure out what the code is for that. And then you can apply that as a, like as a filter to either exclude such alignments or to only include such alignments. And we're gonna go through some examples in the practicals of how you would do that. There's also this really nice web utility. I wonder if I can get it to open. It's not on the right screen. Like, I might just have to stop sharing and reshare. So we could find my Zoom controls. PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. So that link takes you to this nice utility that um, the Broad Institute provides where you can go two ways. You can either enter in. Uh, so you can either enter in a value, like we saw there was an alignment with one, that had the flag of 163 and it will tell you which properties are yes and which properties are no, according to that. Or you can go with the reverse. Like you can say, I want everything where a read is paired and mapped in a proper pair. And I don't know, 
a supplementary alignment if you're interested in that for some reason. And it will tell you what the corresponding flag value is. Any questions about that? Okay. So those are flags. The other thing I said we would talk about briefly is the cigar string. So that's this guy here. Cigar string is short for compact idiosyncratic gap alignment report. I kind of think of this, you know, if you've ever done like a blast alignment, I assume most people have at some point like done blast, right? You take your sequence and you submit it to blast and you get back these kind of like text alignments where it's like your read and the thing it aligned to and there's like the little lines right that show like okay you had matches here and then maybe there's like a gap which is like some asterisks or something it's like a, a visual representation of your alignment this is kind of like that but just trying to be much more efficient right like instead of a kind of like nice human readable graphical representation of how your read matches up with the reference it's like more of a, almost like a mathematical representation. So it works um, by providing a string of base lengths and so-called operations, which indicate um, how the bases align to the reference or are deleted or inserted or et cetera. I feel like this is easiest to understand from an example. So this is an example of a cigar string. 81M, 859, and 19M. So this is actually a 100 base pair read where the first 81 bases of the read match or align to the reference. Then there's an 859 base gap or skip, which is an intron. And then there's nine, another 19 bases of matching, which is more alignment. So this is actually giving you a very simple example where you've got like, most of the read aligns to some part of the genome and then the alignment stops, right? Because it's a spliced alignment in this case and it picks up about a thousand bases down and then continues on. So you can express the idea of that alignment in like a relatively efficient string of characters. That's all the cigar string is doing. Again, it's not likely that you're gonna be really looking with your eyes and interpreting cigar strings that often but it's something that downstream tools are looking at to understand your alignments. Any questions about cigar strings? Yes. Yeah, the translocation example, what would it happen here? Would it still recognize it as like a tonic region? Like if you took the chromosomes and your reference to the model? That is a good question. How, um, translocations are represented in cigar strings. I think it just would show you, yeah, you'd almost need like, you'd need like two cigar strings basically for each alignment. Each cigar string starts with the premise that it can be described against one reference sequence, like one, one string, <laughs> the one chromosome reference. Yeah, so that, that's one of the reasons why there's like a whole special category of tools that like, are used to detect structural variants or RNA genes at the RNA level. They have to kind of piece together information from multiple like alignments and figure out like where they make sense and describe a structural event. Because typically for the case of a structural variant, like a translocation, like if you went to your BWA mem alignment, say, and you looked at your read, what would happen is like it would match where, you know, say chromosome one, where it's aligning to. And then at the point where it stops matching, the alignment, the read is still there and you get like basically like mismatches, right? It's like this, the rest doesn't match and those would be like maybe soft clipped, right? And so they would probably be represented here in the cigar string as like a series of soft clip bases. And then there would be another read probably on the other chromosome that had the inverse of that situation. And like Malachi says, you need to run like a special tool that spots that pattern. And it's like, oh, there's this, these two regions of soft clipping and maybe they match up and you can realign the part that didn't match to figure out where like where the translocation is. But it's not like natively supported in the BAM file. Yeah. 
country in the BAM file. But when we created the BAM file, we combined the one data and the two data, right? Mm -hmm. And then each entry in the BAM file starts with one read, but gives you a little bit of information about the paired read. Would there be another entry for that paired read? That yeah. Yeah, and if you sort by read name, you'll see them always right next to each other. You'll see read one, read two, read one, read two. But if you sort by position, you know, they'll be separated in the band file depending on how big the fragment was. And, yeah. That's, I think, one of the reasons why each line in the alignment also gives you at least some basic information about where the pair is. Because right. it could be quite far away. And so that helps, like, when you're reading through the band file to kind of, like, understand that pair, the, the nature of the pairing. Good question. Okay, just a quick note on CRAM files. So we've been talking about SAM files and BAM files, but increasingly you will come across CRAM files, which are just yet another innovation in BAM files, basically to make them even more efficient to store. So sequence data is, is pretty big and hard disks are, hard drives are expensive. So um, there was a lot of motivation to make BAM files smaller. And CRAM files can be like as much as 30 to 60% smaller than the corresponding BAM file. And it does this through a couple of innovations. One is that it's storing the alignments in reference to a reference. So that creates some efficiency. So like you can do things like if you're, if you have a hundred base pair read and it matches perfectly to the reference from position, whatever, 10,000 to 10,100, you can do something like say like, don't store hardly any information about the sequence, just point to the reference and say, if you wanna know what the sequence is, go to chromosome one position 10,000 plus hundred bases, there's your read. So you can make the file much smaller by like using this known information about this reference file, which doesn't change um, to basically encode information about the read in a more efficient way. It also does things like compress the quality scores. So, um, I guess someone thought at some point, like, what's really the difference between a base that has a quality score of 10 or 20 versus 22? Like, we could consider those, like, roughly the same in how we treat them, and there won't be that much loss of performance for things like variant calling and other things like that downstream. So they basically, like, map all of the quality scores within a certain bin to just one value and simplify it. And then that allows the file to be compressed more because the file is basically simpler. So that may or may not, that's one of the like, probably the trade-offs with um, CRAM files, depending on how you create them. So there are ways to create CRAM files that do this kind of quality compression or not. And so that might be something you wanna think about, like whether you're okay with that sort, cause you are kind of like losing information and there's a way that you can like, convert your BAM to CRAM, and then if you throw away the BAM file, you could technically never get back to the exact BAM file that you started with because you've like compressed this information and kind of lost some specificity, depending on how you made your CRAM file. There are ways to make your CRAM file that it's like the reverse trip is um, faithful to the original BAM file, uh, but then the space savings is less. So there's trade-offs there. I think we've talked about this already. How should you sort your BAM SAM file? Um, the basically the two main options are position sorting or coordinate sorting uh, versus read name sorting. And that just depends on your downstream application. So some programs will want the BAM file to be sorted by position. That's the most common probably, but others will expect it to be sorted by, by read name. And so you just have to be aware of that. That may that's like a common error that you'll get like. This BAM file doesn't appear to be sorted properly, and you have to resort it from one way to the other way and back. I think we've looked at bed, bed files. Um, bed files are pretty simple. They're commonly used kind of in conjunction with BAM files to specify kind of arbitrary sets of coordinates or regions of interest. So, like maybe you have a bunch of variants you care about or a bunch of promoter sequences or 
um, enhancers or who knows, any arbitrary subset of the genome that you care about for some reason could be represented as a bed file. And then you can intersect that bed file with your alignments in various ways using different bioinformatics tools. This is an example of what a bed file looks like. They're very simple. Um, minimally, uh, they have three columns, which is the bed three format. So they basically have to have a chromosome, a start and a stop. But then there's a number of other um, optional fields up to, I think, bed 12 um, that specify um, things related to how you visualize bed files and things like the UCSC genome browser. Um, so you might give it a name and you might give it like information that allows it to create like those, those nice visuals where you have like a thinner rectangle and then a thicker rectangle and, or a thin line, that sort of thing. Most often people are using bed files just like more or less with these three columns to specify specific regions of the genome. And there are lots of tools you can use to manipulate SAM and BAM and bed files. We've already played around with some of these like SAM tools and Picard uh, and bed tools. And I thought I would just end with a few common challenges or gotchas or sources of confusion when doing stuff with BAM files and bed files and um, sequence alignments in general. And these relate to coordinate systems, genome builds and variant representation. So the biggest source of confusion around coordinates is that there are two competing formats um, or representations for coordinates. One is a so-called one-based and the other is zero-based. So the idea is pretty simple. People could not agree on whether we should number the bases directly. So imagine this is chromosome one and there wasn't the problem of ends, you know, with the telomeres that it just started with bases and it started with T, A, C, G, T, C, A. So this is the first base of the chromosome. And a lot of people thought it was logical to number that base one and the second base two and so on. But for various like mathematical reasons, mostly, or computer science reasons, um, zero base systems can work better for like arithmetic operations and things like that. So an equally um, opinionated set of people felt that the bases should not be numbered directly, but rather we should number between the bases. So like the zero position is right before the first base and one doesn't correspond to a base. It corresponds to the position between the first and second base. And two is the position between the second and third base and so on. And like the bioinformatics world is literally almost perfectly evenly split between these two systems. So like, depending if you go to UCSC versus ensemble, or you're talking about a bed file or a BAM file or a SAM file, it's gonna be one or the other of these. And it's like yeah, almost like a perfect mix of both. So that means you're constantly having to think about like, do I need to convert my one base coordinates to zero based or my zero base coordinates to one based or be careful about comparing files where like you're comparing a file of variants that are in zero based to another file of variants that are one based and you're like these aren't matching up or why can't I find this variant or why can't I find this position and when you start digging into it you'll see oh it's like all the positions are always off by one this is usually the reason for that and I'm just showing some examples like to make it real this is, these are things we deal with every day like a a single variant might be represented like this, like it's on chromosome one from position four to four, and it's a G, but in the zero base system, it would be, it's at position three to four, because you're talking about right, this, you're basically giving the, the coordinates that flank the base rather than the coordinates that directly represent the base. Yeah. So zero base methods consider always there is one, that there's always one like number or yeah. position between uh, yes that's correct yes yeah. yeah yeah that's right So there's some advantages to it. Like for example, if you think about insertions, like I'm gonna insert 
a bunch of bases, somehow that is more intuitive that it's like, okay, there's the position here indicated by a single number two where the inserted bases are going. Um, yeah. Other questions about that? Just something to be aware of. It could be a source of confusion or, or errors. Genome builds, we've also alluded to this. This is also just something to be aware of. It's kind of obvious now, I think, to most people, but there are different genome builds, right? So like different attempts to assemble the sequence data that we have for the human genome or other genomes into a definitive reference. That is like um, an ongoing process and in not totally solved problem. So every few years, it's less frequent now. It used to be much more frequent. Like every couple of years, you'd have a new version of the human genome released, right? Like I don't remember the first version I dealt with. It was probably like 16 or 15 or something. And now we're on whatever we're on, 19, 20. Um, and then there are competing ways of referring to them. So like, uh, GRC37 is also known as HG19, which is also known as B37. Um, so you have to kind of get used to the names and synonyms of the reference genome you care about and then be consistent, right? So make sure if someone gives you data, which is GRC37 and you're comparing it to some data you have, which is GRC38, like that's not going to work. So you're going to have to like convert one of them. There are ways to do that. So you could either like realign one data set so that they're all consistently aligned. That's the preferred thing, but it can be time and computationally expensive. There are also liftover tools that allow you to convert between builds. So take the coordinates from GRC38 and convert it to the equivalent in GRC38, which work most of the time pretty well. And you can even use those tools to convert between orthologous regions in different species. So just be aware of genome builds. It's like one of the most common sources of problems. When your results don't make sense, it's like because you've got some kind of genome build mismatch between your annotations and your alignments or something. And then the last thing is this problem of variant alignment and parsimony. So the concept of parsimony is when you're talking about variants is to represent a variant in as few nucleotides as possible. And the concept of aligning is to shift the position of the variant as far to the left or right as possible. And the reason this is necessary is because there is a natural ambiguity when you describe variations in the genomes, especially in situations like this where you have repetitive elements. So imagine you have this sequence that's like G, 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 and then CA, 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 G, G, G. So you've got four copies of this CA and you sequence, that's in your reference. Now you've, you've got a sequence reader and it only has three copies of CA. Unless you do some really sophisticated molecular biology, you don't really have any way of knowing which of those four CAs is deleted, right? Like from our, for our purposes, they're all functionally equivalent. The end result is the same, whether you delete the first one or the second one, or the third one or the fourth one, either way, you end up with a read that's got three CAs instead of four, right? But now you're trying to represent that variant and tell someone else about it. Which CA do you say is deleted? And people don't agree on that either. So <laughs> the community is like full of different standards and formats. Like we should always left shift. We should always right shift. We should include like, we should always mention the base before the deleted thing in the reference and then so like these are all ways that you could represent that same um, alteration. So here it's showing you like basically like which CA is deleted and then different conventions. Like should we just have the reference be the CA and the alternate just be like empty or a dot? Should we have the reference be like the CA plus a trailing base and then the alt B or a leading base and so on and so forth. I think you get where I'm going. So. Like this particular group would advocate for this final solution, which is that we should do left normalizing and include a base before and have it be as short as possible without being empty. So they would say that we should call it like this first GCA goes to just G, meaning the first CA has been lost. So if you're doing anything at all with like variants, you will come across this problem as well. So just be aware of that.